Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Mills, and I would like to welcome you all to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton online church service this morning. I would especially like to welcome any visitors who might be with us today and invite you to join us for conversation in the breakout sessions once the service has ended. Our Zoom screen setup is a bit different this morning. I've gone with a vertical format presentation. You should be able to maximize your screen to see the presentation while still seeing having room for the strip of videos on the side. So uh, with that vertical format, there should be a little space on either side. And you should be able to move the uh, strip of videos off to one side so that you can continue to see the presentation. On iPhones or tablets, uh, you may actually have to unpinch to make the screen a little bigger. Uh, but that seems to work well on phones and tablets to make that out until it's big enough so that you can see it. So welcome again, everybody. Uh, if you're new here, I invite you to go to our online guest book. So if you look at our website, which is there on the screen, at the top, there's a circle around the guest book. And if you would assign the guest book, uh, we'd love to be able to contact you. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, the original home of Cree, Blackfoot, and many other Indigenous people. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors for all of our children. We're going to start with a prelude. Uh, this morning I've got videos of Coriolis that I've recorded over the years. This version of Uvalate Deo was performed by Coriolis in 2013. Now, Uvalate Deo means shout to God. There's going to be a lot of God talk in this service. Uh, the video may be a bit jerky uh, on some screens, and there's some static that kicks in from time to time. But hopefully this music comes across well. Let's uh, play the prelude. You
For this morning's service, I'm going to take a look at a radical theology. I'm going to take a brief, brief look into the background of Unitarianism as part of my own free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Some of you may know that I'm the son of a Baptist minister, that my brother is also a Baptist minister, and that two of my uncles were Baptist ministers, and that most unexpectedly, I ended up going to Catholic high school. So yes, Christianity had a strong influence on me. But my father also encouraged me to read the scriptures and to form my own opinions. As a Baptist, he said I was free to believe my own interpretations of the scripture as part of what is called the priesthood of all believers. Today, I'm going to take a look at some of my explorations of scripture and show you some of the conclusions that I have found. This passage on the screen from Mark is famous for its commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. But the first part of that quote also says that the Lord your God is one Lord. This is Jesus saying that God is a single entity. And it appears to me here that Jesus spoke as if God was separate from himself. This is the crux of the debate about Unitarianism, the Trinity defined by the early church, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit required that you believe that Jesus and God were the same, and that Jesus was, in fact, an inseparable part of God. Today, I hope to show you evidence from the scriptures that Jesus was distinct and separate from God and not part of the Trinity. A slighter chalice. We gather this hour as people of faith, with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning, and celebration of the life we share together. I invite you to light your own chalice at home or to light a candle to remind you of the flame of our shared community. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a self-governing and self-supporting community. We rely on your donations to support the staff and programs of our church. During this time when we're meeting virtually, there are a number of electronic methods you can use to support our church. First of all, we thank everyone who set up ongoing automatic donations to the church. If you don't use automatic donations, I encourage you to set them up. Give me a call and I'll help you get them started. To donate by credit card, you can use the Canada Helps Payment Service. There is a link on the UC webpage so that you can use this method. It's also possible to send an Interact bank transfer to the church using your online banking. Send your payment to the church office email, which is chadmin at uce.ca. And yes, we can still accept checks by mail. However you donate, we thank you for your support of our church. Each month, UCE identifies a charity with whom we would normally share half of our unidentified contributions. During our virtual gatherings, we don't have unidentified contributions, but we know that these charities still need funding. The charity for the month of May is the Youth Empowerment and Support Services, or YES. We encourage you to donate to YES directly through their website, which is yess.org. For the offertory music today, we have Coriolis singing Learn to Fly from a performance recorded in 2011. And I think you'll see Jim Logan taking the offering and somebody sounds like they brought their entire jar of pennies to uh, contribute. So you hear this big chink at one point as they're collecting the offering. And then at the end of the offering, uh, we can sing along from you I receive to you I give. <laughs>
gospel readings today. So today's readings are going to be taken from new translations of the gospels that I have. These first two readings are from the Gospel of Thomas, which you may not be familiar with. The Gospel of Thomas has been preserved by the Egyptian Coptic Church and was only discovered in the late 40s. The Gospel of Thomas is an early sayings gospel written to preserve the sayings of Jesus. Now, <laughs> I've got to tell you that when you read some of these early Gospels, uh, Jesus is a very, uh, he's stirring things up. And so sometimes he, what he's saying is difficult to understand. And some of the later evangelists, when they wrote their Gospels, they tried to interpret his sayings to try to make them more palatable. So by going back to some of the earlier Gospels, we can find some of these less comfortable sayings. So as we read these, I'd like you to think of how Jesus is describing his relationship with either God or the Holy Spirit. So the first one is, if the flesh came into being because of the Spirit, that's a marvel. But if Spirit came into being because of the body, that is a marvel of marvels. Yet I marvel at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. Hmm, interesting. Where there are three deities, they are divine. Where there are two or one, I am that with that one. That seems to imply Trinity in some case. But anyway, these are all for us to think about. An important part of our community is the sharing of the joys and sorrows of our lives. I invite anyone who wishes to share a candle to do so by using the chat function or by sending your cares and concerns in an email to candles at uce.ca and, uh, and uh, you'll be answered if you send your uh, concerns to candles. Let's light candles of cares and concerns. So Erin says for her mother's health, Lilius is saying for all the injustices done to African Americans. We'll light a candle for the tragedy of uh, Stephen and Gerard, Stephen passing away in hospital. Yes, Stephen. Let us think of one more candle for all those cares and concerns mentioned here today, but also for the joys and concerns unspoken that dwell in our hearts. Thank you. Well, I have some more readings. Uh, this next set of readings is from the Gospel of Mark. And again, it's a, it's a different translation than what most people are used to. So the words are a little different. Uh, the, the first verse that I'm going to read is just after uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And just as he got up out of the water, he saw the skies torn open and the spirit coming down towards him like a dove. There was also a voice from the skies. You are my favorite son. I fully approve of you. Then this verse was from when Jesus was with Peter, James, and John on a mountaintop. And a cloud moved in and cast a shadow over them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my favored son, listen to him. This verse was from the Garden of Gethsemane. And he would say, Abba, which means father, all things are possible with you. Take this cup away from me. But it's not what I want that matters, but what you want. And this verse from G during Jesus' trial. 
Once again, the high priest questioned him and says to him, are you the anointed, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus replied, I am, and you will see the son of Adam sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of the sky. So are you seeing a separation between Jesus and God in these readings? When I read these, I see a conversation between two distinct entities. Does it appear to you that Jesus and God could be the same entity in these verses? Hmm. So let's take time to reflect on today's topic. We'll start with a minute of reflection, and then after the reflection, we'll have another song from Coriolis that features a song featuring our Jewish heritage. So let's go to my backyard on a sunny day with our fountain, and let's have a reflection.
was the last time you heard of any church debating the nature of God? Modern Unitarianism gathers its teachings from many sources, but it originated in a dispute over an interpretation of the Bible and the concept of the Trinity. The essence of the debate was whether God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were one indivisible entity or whether the three aspects were separate entities. Unitarians became those who believed in the unity of one God and not in the trinity of God that was defined by the early Christian church. The first council of Nicaea, Nicaea in 325 in the Common Era was established by the Emperor Constantine to try and resolve this issue as it was dividing the Christian church at the time. The main issue at that time was a debate about when Jesus came into existence. The Trinity side said that Jesus was created before creation as part of God and was made flesh so that he could appear on earth. In this argument, Jesus and God were always the same and had always existed together. They were said to be consubstantial. The other aspect of the debate came to be called Arianism. Arianism was named after the clergyman Arius from Libya. The Arianism argument was that Jesus was created separately from God at some time and did not exist before creation. Arius himself wrote, If the Father begat the Son, then he who was begotten had a beginning in existence, and from this it follows that there was a time when the Son was not. The argument was not about whether Jesus was divine, but whether Jesus was an inseparable aspect of God and whether Jesus had existed before creation. After much debate and under pressure from the emperor to come to a decision, the Council of Nicaea decided that Jesus and God were one. Note that this is not the Trinity yet, as the Holy Spirit was not discussed at this first council. They created a creed to define Christianity and to declare that God and Jesus were of the same essence. The picture shows Arius defeated on the floor in front of the council. Eight years later, in 333, Constantine took things further with this edict. And I hereby make a public order that if someone should be discovered to have hidden a writing composed by Arius and not to have immediately brought it forward and destroyed it by fire, his penalty shall be death. As soon as he is discovered in this offense, he shall be submitted for capital punishment. But this didn't end the controversy. Arianism had many converts, including Constantine's son, who actually became the next emperor. The eastern half of the Christian church ended up following Arianism. That's the part of the church we know as Eastern Orthodox. While the Western church, the Roman Catholic church, stayed with Nicene Christianity. The Council of Nicaea also hadn't decided where the Holy Spirit fit into the, into the debate. Theodosius I became emperor in 380 and converted to Christianity after recovering from an illness. He was determined to get the eastern and western parts of the Christian church to rejoin. As emperor, he couldn't afford to have his empire divided along religious lines. Theodosius ordered the Council of Constantinople in 381 to settle the question of Arianism. The council also needed to resolve the problem of where the Holy Spirit fit with God. In the Council of Constantinople, the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, was added as another consubstantial part of God, along with the Father and the Son. This created the Trinity as it's known today. Essentially, the decision was that all three parts of the Trinity were considered aspects of the same God. Theodosius issued the decree of what he called Nicene Christianity in 391, that required everyone in the empire to conform to this Trinitarian creed. He also banned the remaining pagan rituals that were still popular at that time. The Apostles' Creed, also called the Nicene Creed, has been modified over the last 1,600 years, but still contains the belief in the consubstantial trinity. In this partial translation of the 381 Creed, 
we see in the second clause that Jesus was begotten before all worlds, that is, before creation, and is therefore consubstantial with the Father. In the last clause I show here, we see that the Holy Ghost with the Father and Son are worshipped as one. The Christians had declared that Jesus was God. As a, as a result of the Council of Constantinople and some political maneuverings, Theodosius was able to rejoin the eastern and western parts of the Christian church, church under the creed of the Trinity. Those who would not agree to the creed were considered, considered heretics. Okay, so the Unitarians were the original heretics. <laughs> the early Unitarians were following a radical theology at the time that there was one God, and more importantly, that Jesus was not God. So how did they come to that conclusion? Up until the Reformation, the Catholic Church controlled most aspects of religion in people's lives. In the late Renaissance, there was a movement to go back to the classics in art and religion. This was a concept called ad fontes, inspired by this ad fontes movement. A Dutch priest called Erasmus published a Greek version of the New Testament in 1516 by collecting as many of the Greek texts as he could find. He prepared a side-by-side -side comparison between the Greek, as you see here on the left, and the Latin on the right. And he compared it with the Latin Bible that the Catholic Church was using. He showed that the Latin Bible the Catholic Church was using was full of errors and mistranslations. Primed by the Ad Fontes movement of the Renaissance and the advent of the printing press, many people were able to read Greek, and the Erasmus Bible sold out quickly. In 1454, Gutenberg printed the first Bible, which was a copy of the Catholic's Latin Bible, um, so that was the, uh, similar to what was there. The availability of the printing press made it possible for people to disseminate religious writings, and this led to a rush to translate the Bible into many languages. Martin Luther published his first German Bible in 1526. You can see the title page in the upper left. The first Bible in English was a New Testament, translated also in 1526 by William Tyndale while hiding in Europe. He was hiding because Henry VIII had declared it illegal to translate a non-sanctioned Bible into English. Tyndale was eventually captured and martyred for his work. The King James Bible was completed in 1611 and took many of its phrases directly from the Tyndale Bible. I recommend the book called God's Secretaries, which gives an excellent account of how the King James Bible was created. The King James Bible defined English Christianity for centuries and many Christians will still think that this translation in Shakespearean English is still the official Bible. The bottom Im image is my father's own King James Bible that he had from 1957. The printing press was the disruptive technology of the day, making books and pamphlets available to a wide audience. You could say that the printing press made the Bible go viral. People could now read and interpret the Bible for themselves in their own language. This led to the concept called the priesthood of all believers, which was a basic concept of Martin Luther's Reformation. The priesthood of all believers said that the individual was responsible for their own theology based on their ability to read and interpret the Bible. Very similar to the Unitarian search for independent search for truth and meaning. These new reformers went to a Bible that they could read in their own language and interpreted it for themselves. The Protestant Reformation took the power of interpreting the scriptures away from the Catholic Church and gave it to people who could read their own Bibles. Many new Protestant groups sprung up over this ability to interpret scripture. They believed that the Bible was the highest source of church authority instead of official Catholic doctrine. Different interpretations created different denominations. The Anabaptists, for example, brought back full immersion baptism, pointing out that John the Baptist had never done infant baptisms. Other denominations split off over the definitions of communion. Some split off over the definitions of church government. 
Our Unitarian denomination started as a theological debate in 1556 within the Calvinist Reformed Church in Poland, making it one of the earliest Protestant denominations. The first use of the Unitarian name happened in Transylvania in 1568. Like all literate reformers of the day, the Unitarians had read their Bibles and had come to their own conclusion that God was a single entity and not the Trinity that had been defined by the Catholic Church. So people were regarding their new Bibles as the authoritative word of God, but how accurate were these Bibles? Erasmus was one of the first to point out that translating from Greek to Latin was not always perfectly clear. He pointed out a number of errors in the Catholic Latin Bible. This was problematic because the church said that the Bible was the infallible work of God. You still get people today that will accept what's written in the Bible without question. They don't understand that the Bible is a collection of the interpretations, attitudes, politics, and the prejudices of the translators. My discussion today is about the Trinity, and so I'm going to confine my discussion to the Gospels of the New Testament. The Gospels are said to be the account of Jesus' life on earth. The four main canonical Gospels are the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But where did these come from? And more importantly, when were they written? Most Christians don't know that the Gospels were not written by Jesus' disciples. Jesus' dis disciples were mostly fishermen and would not have known how to read or write. They had scribes in those days because most people were not literate. When the Gospels were named, the authors of the day applied Christian names to them. In much the same way as my Christian parents named me James Andrew, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written by disciples. After Jesus' death, in the, er the early Christians went into hiding. The Apostle Paul was an example of those who were persecuting the early Christians until his conversion on the road to Damascus. There was an oral period where Jesus' followers passed along his sayings and parables in secret. It's estimated that the first records would not have been written down until at least the year 60, which was about 30 years after Jesus' death. These first records have all been lost, but three sources have been inferred by the Gospels. Um, you can see on this chart up by the first letters of Paul in the written Gospels that shows Q and signs. These no longer exist, but they have been inferred from the, uh, from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that this is where they had some sources that they were referring to. Uh, there was also one from, from Thomas that's on a different track. These early Gospels are called Sayings Gospels and would have been just collections of the sayings of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark appears to have been written first around the year 70. Matthew and Luke were thought to have been written around the year 80. And the Gospel of John appears to have been written a little later, around the year 90. The earliest known copy of a Gospel that we have appears to be from about the year 180. There's no original texts written by those who knew Jesus and no original texts written by the authors of the Gospels. The information in the Gospels started as an oral tradition, were likely first written down as collections of sayings, and then were passed along from handwritten copy to handwritten copy for a hundred years before we find the first copies that we can Today I'm going to use a new translation of the Gospels. The Jesus Seminar uh, produced two books of modern translations in the early 90s. The first was called The Five Gospels, which brought the Gospel of Thomas into um, um, wide uh, distribution. And the second was called The Complete Gospels, and this contains 21 Gospels and Gospel fragments, fragments that have been unearthed in the last 100 years. These were modern English translations and were not influenced by any religious sponsor group as had been common with all other Bible translations. The Jesus Seminar included the Gospel of Thomas and the Five Gospels. It's a sayings gospel that they think even predated the canonical Gospels. We can immediately see some differences between these five early Gospels. 
The Gospels of Mark and Thomas are sayings Gospels and don't have much narrative. Each saying is simply introduced with the line, Jesus said. Neither of these Gospels have Jesus' birth story, for example. Matthew and Luke share 200 of the same verses, which suggests that they were adapted from the same source. They, they think that both Matthew and Luke uh, drew on the source called Q. But these two Gospels are the only ones that contain the birth story. The Gospel of John is unlike any of the others and has a rich storytelling narrative. It's thought that the Gospel of John was written much later and does not use the same sources as the other three Gospels. The Jesus Seminar produced Gospels written in modern English in a translation that I find trustworthy. So I can now practice the priesthood of all believers and look into the Gospels for myself and try to find the evidence for or against the Trinity argument. If we accept that the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John are the works of later evangelists, then the best evidence for the Trinity would be in the early sayings Gospels of Mark and Thomas. The later evangelists would have been tempted to embellish those earlier sayings and to try to uh, smooth out some of the more radical sayings of Jesus. So I had found five passages in Mark and three in Thomas that I think explain that Jesus is separate from God and the Holy Spirit. I read some of these for you earlier in the service. So I'm going to wrap up the readings today with two final passages that I think support the non-Trinitarian argument. First is from Thomas 15. Jesus said, when you see one who was not born of woman fall on your face and worship, that one is your father. Since Jesus was clearly born of woman, he would therefore not be the father. In this saying, Jesus is referring to another entity as the father, and that entity is not Jesus. And finally, this passage from Mark. Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. Again, it appears to me that Jesus makes a distinction between himself and God. To me, these passages, taken from a Bible translation that I trust, make it clear to me that the concept of a consubstantial trinity is not persuasive. To me, Jesus is not the same as God, and that Jesus is not God. So where did the trinity come from? Well, the early Christians worshipped the cult of Jesus and felt that Jesus was divine. There are many examples in other religions and in Greek philosophy of multi-part gods, and it appears that many of these influences came together with the politics of Constantine in 325 to forge Jesus and God into one entity. It was controversial at the time, but the Trinity has gone on to become the main creed of the Christian church, including the church found by Martin Luther, and we see the Trinity in all of the Christian churches of today. During the Reformation, new translations of the Bible became available in languages that most people could read, and different denominations broke away as they took issues with some of the interpretations that the Catholic Church had made. But for some reason, the Trinity remained. You will still find the creed of the Trinity in most Protestant churches today, this desire to elevate Jesus to the status of God was persistent even during the Reformation when many church practices and many aspects of theology were questioned. Our Unitarian tradition has a long history of the search for truth and meaning. Today, I've tried to point out the radical theology that formed the beginnings of our Unitarian tradition and to explain some of my own explorations into my own theology. Through my own research, I'm a Unitarian by choice. I do not see any evidence to support the Trinity in the translations of the Bible that I trust. I believe that Jesus was a remarkable person who shook the Jewish church to its foundations, but I don't believe in Jesus as God. I look forward to our interesting discussions during coffee time. Amen. Our closing words today are from John W. Brigham. Go your ways 
knowing not the answers to all things, yet seeking always the answer to one more thing than you know. The chalice is extinguished, but its light lives on in the minds and hearts and souls of each one of you. So carry that flame with you as you leave this place and share it with those you know, with those you love, and most especially with those you have yet to meet. You can extinguish your chalices at home and we'll sing Carry the Flame. We have a few announcements uh, that I have listed here. Uh, there's a Tuesday evening coffee hour uh, on Zoom. Uh, you can see uh, links to that from the church website. On Wednesday, Reverend Ann's coffee chat is also available on Zoom. I think you can find that uh, on our website and on the uh, uh, Westwood uh, website. On Thursdays, there are Zoom practice sessions. The Vancouver Unitarians are holding Zoom practice sessions if you'd like to learn more. And there's details in this month's newsletter. Saturday, Alara has a story time with Spruce and she is doing that Saturdays at three o'clock. And I think you'd find the link to that both in our newsletter and on the Westwood website. Okay. All right, next, next Sunday, uh, let me just click this. Next Sunday is uh, next Sunday service is Flower Communion with Beth Jenkins. The Flower Communion is an annual service that celebrates beauty, human uniqueness, diversity, and community. Please select a fresh flower or a picture of a favorite flower to place near your webcam while we share music, reflections, stories, and poems about flowers and their significance. We're going to do a, uh, a postlude. Uh, I'm just going to mute everybody again. Uh, and while I do this postlude, um, you can uh, go refill your coffee and get ready for coffee hour. Uh, this is going to, this postlude is, about, postlude is about three minutes. So it'll give you time to get up and take a quick, uh, quick run to grab your coffee. Uh, and then once this is, uh, postlude is done, we'll come back uh, to the coffee hour. Let's, uh, I'll just mute everybody and then we'll start the postlude.